uh, related to the history of civil rights organizing in DC. Um, these include a project called A Right to the City uh, uh, that was created by the Anacostia Community Museum. Hopefully uh, some of you have gotten to see it. It was also um, shown at the DC Public Libraries. Um, another project that we worked on is the 20th Century African American Civil Rights Tour um, for the DC Historic Preservation Office. And this is available online. I'll throw links uh, to these things in the chat um, after I talk. Um, and, um, and currently I'm involved in a, a, a forthcoming exhibit for um, the uh, newly renovated MLK Library downtown. Um, this will be the permanent exhibition It's called Up From the People. Um, and it's you know, largely about the history of organizing in DC. It will be opening in 2021. Um, so I hope you all get, get an opportunity to see that. Um, when all of our buildings open again. So, and I wanted to mention that the, the Julius Hobson collection was actually the first, the very first collection um, that uh, was acquired by the, the DC Public Library as, a, as um, you know, it, as part of what became uh, now known as the People's Archive. So this is now quite a large collection that documents the history of community organizing in DC, um, you know, includes oral histories, uh, uh, photographs um, and many people's papers and many organizations' papers. So um, anyway, so there's like um, I uh, this is just a little bit, little bit of about, about background about how this topic emerged for me. Um, so and I'm really pleased that Humanities DC gave me a, a grant, um, a, a Humanitini curator grant um, to run this program. Um, and normally these humanities are something that is done live and there's lots of, you know, sort of informal discussion with the audience. Hopefully we can, we can replicate some of that online tonight. So I just wanna quickly um, introduce three special guests that are here that are not on the panel um, in hopes that um, there might be a little bit of time for them to make a, a very brief remarks later or, or at least so that you know that they're in the audience so that you can ask questions of these people um, if, if we have time. So. So first up, um, I want to introduce Julius Hobson Jr. And if you could just give a wave so that people know which person you are on the screen. Um, so this is Julius Hobson's son. He's a graduate of Howard University and of George Washington University. Um, he's a senior policy advisor at, at uh, Polsinelli, where he advocates for clients on, on legislation on a number of issues. Uh, he was the um, he led the Division of Congressional Affairs at the American Medical Association, um, was on the staff of, of Senator Charles Robb of Virginia, worked for the DC's mayor, DC mayor's office, and also handled, handled congressional affairs for Howard University, um, and is, an adjunct, is also an adjunct professor at GW. Um, in 1973, uh, Mr. Hobson was elected to the DC Board of Education um, the year before his father was elected to DC's first home rule city council. Um, my second special guest that is here uh, is Tina Hobson. If Tina Hobson could get, give a wave. I can't actually see my whole screen. So, okay, great. So Tina became engaged to Julius Hobson in 1967, uh, the year before he joined DC's first elected. First, 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 first elect I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so, and she married Julius in 1969 and worked closely with him until his death in 1977. Um, and one of the things they worked on together was a successful and influential lawsuit um, against the FBI agents who tapped their phones. Uh, and maybe Tina can fill us in on this if we have time. Uh, so Julius was a candidate in several local political campaigns during these years, and he first adopted the DC statehood platform in 1970. Um, during this, this period when he ran against Reverend Walter Fontroy to become DC's first non-voting delegate to Congress. Um, and in 1972, Julius ran for Vice President of the United States alongside Dr. Benjamin Spock, um, whose campaign focused on opposing the Vietnam War. Um, and then 1974, Julius won a seat on DC's first elected city council. Um, and then finally, our third special guest is Debbie Hanrahan, who hopefully can give us a wave. There she is. Um, in 1969, Debbie was hired by Julius to assist him with research on the unequal allocation of resources to DC schools. Uh, Julius was tracking the results of his successful 1967 lawsuit against DC public schools and preparing his second case against the schools um, at that time, which he won in 1971. And both these cases were known as Hobson v. Hansen. 
um, and that Debbie also joined Julius and others in fighting the construction of freeways through the city and in advocating for DC statehood. And the first time I talked with Debbie on the phone about this project, she told me that, quote, anyone who worked with Julius Hobson was changed for the better. Um, and in reading all of these bios, I remembered that we were gonna start this program with the film. So should we do that now? And then I'll introduce our moderator, Parisa, and we'll, you'll get a little bit of context for all of these things that I've, that I've told you in these, um, about the special guests. <laughs> Great, yeah, let's do that. It's a, a great little film um, and some of it's a little, it was made quite a while ago, so the quality is not great. So be patient with the sound um, and we'll play it now. I dare Mr. I, I dare Mr. Fontroy to try to debate me in front of them. I dare him to try to debate me in front of the federal employees as much as I've done for the federal employees. I dare him to discuss retail employment downtown. He'd better keep quiet on education. I don't want to hear a cotton picking thing out of him about the hospitals because I desegregated the hospitals in this city and made it possible for black doctors to practice everywhere. Now, name the issues. I, I saw him kill a truck driver. I've seen him kill a hundred men in this city. And I've seen these same familiar faces that are sitting in the audience protest. And I wondered what the world is all about. I'm not a very religious man. Um, in fact, I'm not religious at all. Now, we got old bald-headed, toothless men that are around who are talking about their pride and talking about the fact that they are going to be disgraced or we are not going to lose a war. We have lost the war. We have lost our self-respect. We have lost our civilization. We've lost our human dignity and our goddamn decency by killing people in Vietnam and Africa and everywhere else. Finally, we got a garrison on every continent and a flotilla in every sea. And we are prepared to kill anybody and everybody who disagrees with our right to exploit, murder, and maim the rest of civilization. And I say to the rest of mankind, hell no, out now. The hell with you. We are like Spartacus' army. Broken sword, no resources, against the Roman legions. And I like to fight that way. I don't know about you. <laughs> Well over 300 years, blacks had been in the United States demanding through various means to be accepted as equals in this predominantly white society. At no other time, though, in the history of the civil rights movement was the issue so forced into public attention than in the late 1950s and early 60s. For blacks, it was an era of freedom rides, marches, and forced confrontations. It was a struggle led primarily at first by the church. Leaders like Dr. King, Powell, McKissick, Foreman, and Evers espoused nonviolence, but often they were met by white resistance, destruction, and death. To other black leaders, nonviolence did not make sense, and so a parallel militant movement was born. Julius Hobson was a part of this movement. Paper. 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 Born in Alabama in 1922, Hobson came to Washington in the early 50s. He began organizing civic groups and was finally chosen to head the Congress of Racial Equality here. Hobson, a Marxist by doctrine, perceived the black struggle from a purely economic... You would consider a socialist outline. I am a socialist. I believe in the socialist economics of Karl Marx. I don't believe that we can have a uh, crazy quilt jungle economic setup like we got now where you got millionaires and paupers, half the people starving to death, and the other half with so damn much money till they can't count it. So it was the idea was to center core around that and create that socialist mentality in core, which said under the Constitution, damn it, we want to divide up some of these resources. 
and we want our share. I used to see him, listen to him on radio, and uh, read about him in the paper, and uh, we had a little group called the Nonviolent Action Group, which uh, was working with the Student Nonviolent, uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was primarily based in the South. But since we were here in Washington, D.C., I thought that uh, we couldn't turn a blind spot on what was going on in Washington, and since uh, Mr. Julius Hobson seemed to be the, the man closest to our line of thinking, that is, not only was he a, theor a theoretician, but also a man of practice, we decided to contact him. And when we contacted him, he outlined his program on agitation and trying to bring about uh, raising the level of consciousness of uh, black people in the North. We joined with him, and uh, he did do many, many things. I mean, uh, one of the things that, uh, of course, I think we all learned from him was that you can analyze the situation carefully and then decide where to put the pressure points. And... Uh, as long as you knew where to put the pressure point and put it precisely exactly, you could get results, desired results. And to Hobson, that meant jobs and economic security. He began with demonstrations against local merchants, and then he took on the federal government. This was perhaps his most difficult fight, but also his most rewarding one. Over the years, he represented thousands of federal workers, first on the streets, then in a congressional hearing. Armed with facts of discrimination and intimidation, he made it quite clear that the federal government was not an equal opportunity employer. Many stories still linger. Mrs. Esther Mallory, a mother of four with an invalid husband, worked at HEW. In 1969, that agency tried to suspend her, and the memories are still painful, as she recalls what she maintains was a deliberate scheme of intimidation and harassment. My misfortune. Yet they harassed me, they intimidated me, they even told me that I could leave. But where was I going? How could I afford to support my children? So they did everything that they could to get me out of the agency. I went on the hill, I discussed my problem, and oh, they said to look for another job. What did Mr. Hobson say? How did he react to your case? He himself thought that it was a very bad way of treating me, and he actually cried. He was touched. You say that Julius Hobson helped you. Did anyone else make an attempt to help you? No one else made an attempt to help me. Mrs. Mallory, what did your husband say while all of this was going on? Well, he had a stroke during that time from worry. He fell and broke his rib. That was worry. He was in intensive care at the Washington Hospital Center, and I feel that because of the maltreatment which I received at the agency, this aggravated his condition. And on the 4th of April of this year, my husband passed away. He would often talk about it. He would cry. Sometimes I would get up in, at night and he would be crying and crying. The civil rights reawakening of the 60s had also rekindled the cry for home rule. But in spite of efforts by Kennedy and Johnson, it wasn't until 1967 that a compromise with Congress ended with Walter Washington being appointed mayor in a makeshift government. The name mayor itself was a question since he really had little power. But to Hobson, the choice of the man told the story, and he said so continuing to irritate the establishment. Well, I think Mr. Washington is a good man from uh, Mr. Johnson's point of view. If you would ask me to describe him, I would think that three words which describe most of uh, the appointees, black appointees, Mr. Johnson makes. I'd say colorless, tasteless, and odorless would be a good description of Mr. Washington. Neither Hobson or Washington could foresee what would happen in just eight months. The frustrations Hobson had been talking about erupted, and the Capitol had never been subjected to anything like it. When it was over, the district was in search of a new direction. Months before the riot, a group had been formed, but it was a strained relationship between moderates and militants. And it seemingly perpetuated the age-old struggle between those leaders who wanted change within the system and those who demanded more direct action. 
For two years, black leadership pulled and shoved the system from both sides. The result edged the district closer to home rule. By 1970, there was to be a non-voting delegate, but again, this was a compromise. Oh, idea that came out of the clear blue sky. This is a real possibility. Disturbingly similar to the one that resulted in a mayor. Another position with no power, and Hobson entered the traditional political arena where facts, analysis, and documentation didn't seem to carry the same persuasive power. But he didn't change. I think that there are ways to offer Mr. Fauntleroy and the meaningless Mr. Nevius an opportunity to debate in his holy roller position on any subject that he wants to choose at any time. I think that the public ought to demand a discussion of the issues. And Mr. Fauntleroy can pick the issue if he wants to. I'll even preach a sermon if I have to do that. Sing a solo. Or sing a solo and do some soft shoes. He maintained his maverick style and his basic unwillingness to compromise, which is the heart of the political system. He argued that statehood was the only way to get true self-determination, but many people felt this was unrealistic. So the inability to persuade voters on the statehood issue and his verbal attacks, which angered white and black middle-class voters, cost him the election. We profess to favor freedom in here, and we will not depreciate agitation. So statehood party, let's go and let's keep it together. Of all the arenas, Hobson's fight for equal education is perhaps best known. In spite of the Supreme Court ruling ending segregation, Hobson soon found that poor and black children were still not learning. And he fought it, writing an abundance of articles staging sit-ins and boycotts. He called the first appointed school board a bunch of Uncle Toms for supporting the district's track system, administered by former school superintendent Carl Hansen. Under the track system, a form of ability grouping, children were tested in the sixth grade and put into one of four tracks. Hobson claimed the system was economically discriminatory because test scores distorted the skills of low-income children and they were placed into lower tracks with little upward movement. He maintained that low-income areas were tracked out of receiving a fair share of public monies for the schools. So he went to court and he won. And the impact of this suit was felt throughout the country. I think it set a precedent. It was the, the basis for some other suits which have had a wider implication. One is the um, Serrano versus Preet in California which deals uh, with uh, equal distribution of resources in the schools. And another is the Van Dusart versus Hatfield in Minnesota and the Rodriguez versus San, San Antonio. Um, and some suits since then, like in Richmond, Virginia, and um, I can't recall the other, uh, which have uh, challenged um, the un unequal distribution of tax monies I would say most certainly that Julius Hobson was at least a hundred years ahead of his time. And that is why people really did not understand, but one day maybe they will. By 1969, the district saw its first elected school board. It came about in part from Hobson's school suit. His work helped make him an easy winner for an at-large seat. He got more votes than anyone else. But his demand for a new direction hurt him. At the first organizational meeting, a moderate was named board president. Hobson gave the board a warning. But I appreciate very much the support of the community. I think that uh, my mandate was from the community. I've been making brick without straw so long uh, until it won't matter. I've got something called the right to free. I'm on the board of education, and they're going to abide by it as long as my name is Judy Hobson. But it still hurt. The next year, he refused to run at large and ran instead in Ward 2. He did not campaign effectively, and other board members did, working hard to defeat him. He lost. Again, it may have been his style. An old friend talked about why some did not understand him. People generally tend to uh, think in terms of themselves. A black, prosperous man, or a prosperous black man, whichever you, where we put it, uh, feels pretty much the same as a, a prosperous white man. And he wants to protect what he has. A status quo in climate 
is good in the minds of people who are comfortable in status quo. But even people who feel discomfort in a status quo situation don't understand the challenge of change. And they don't realize the need to, to heighten the consciousness and sensitivity in a way which creates anxiety and sometimes even temporary chaos. Uh, these things are sometimes necessary to change. Julius understands this and understood this and it was necessary. So people therefore generally cannot feel comfortable with his views or the way he expresses them, even though they may feel comfortable with his goal. I, as I said before, as a trained technician, could see that in the years uh, when we were running up and down the street uh, demonstrating that the economic position of black families in the United States, particularly lower middle black families, was deteriorating. The family income gap between white and black families widened from 1960 to 1970, you see. And while the middle class blacks were running up and down the street talking about the right to go to trade of Vicks, the average black wasn't eating. I disagree with the exploitation of the blacks by the blacks as much as I disagree with the exploitation of blacks by the whites. And the painful thing is that I see right now black politicians telling the blacks the same thing that the politicians told the whites when I was a boy in Alabama. That nigger howls every night at 12 o'clock. He eats babies. He's ignorant. He wouldn't know what a steak tastes like. So let him eat fat back. There's no need to give him any more. And some of the black politicians, if you look at the campaigns that are being run, are doing the same thing right now in the black community. I'm at odds with that. I'm also at odds with pie in the sky. And the black community has long enough had Jesus on their backs. I think they got to get him off of their backs and get rid of the pie in the sky and deal with the world that hopes men set their hearts upon and quit being led by a lot of verb splitting Alabama accent preachers whose only objective is to get themselves a Cadillac and get some personal creature comfort. Now, you got evidence of that all over town. Julius, it is said that you could die any day. If you do, and if you quote-unquote meet the maker, if there is one, what will you say to him? <laughs> I don't know. That's, uh, meeting the maker is so far-fetched from my thinking. Uh, and so far from the atheistic background of mine until it's hot, it's a joke. Uh, I don't uh, feel guilty for a goddamn thing that I've done on earth. Uh, uh, I, I, I re withdraw that and uh, repeat the statement by, uh, I believe it was Henry David Thoreau, who said that uh, what demons possess me that I behave so well under the circumstances. And if I have anything to apologize for, it's my good conduct under the circumstances. So if there is a maker uh, and I meet him, uh, well, I'll meet him. I don't know what'll happen when I meet him. I'm sure he's busy as hell if he made all this. And I'm such, so infinite, or so, uh, well, maybe finite until he might not be have time to deal with me. But if I meet him and he's got any sense of justice and got any time, I'd like to talk to him. If I don't get a chance, then I won't. That's just removed from my thinking. I, I, I believe that uh, uh, Julius Hobson was born May 29, 1922. And that someday there'll be a year and a day that they will end that. Now I think that'll be the end of it. And I think if there is any life after death, uh, it'll, it's in Julius Hobson Jr. Or in Jean Hobson, my daughter or in my granddaughter, or in any person who might take up where I left off or who might be interested in what I'm interested in. And in terms of a maker, that strikes of such utter ridiculousness until I can't entertain. What would I tell uh, uh, you, you the maker? Say, look, maker, uh, half the goddamn people in the District of Columbia are hungry. And you, you, you got, you in charge of stuff that grows. Well, why don't you let the stuff grow so they can eat? That's the first thing I want to ask him. I don't want to ask him why he won't take my soul to hell with that. I want to ask him, why don't these kids eat, you know? Why do you let people suffer, maker? To explain to me this, maybe, uh, uh, before I go to sleep. That's what I'd like to know from any maker, you know. Is, uh, what is there about Julius Hobson that he merits a place to live and a balcony and a patio and an automobile uh, that uh, is different where... Sam Jones does not merit it. You know, what, what did he do? 
And why can't we even sum of this up, this justice, you know? And what is this definition of love that you, we've been fighting about and talking about on earth, you know? Can you tell us a couple of these things before you can condemn us to uh, wherever in the hell you're going to condemn us to? You know, you owe us that explanation. Uh, that's my position to the maker, and if he doesn't want to talk about that, the hell with him. I don't want to talk to him. Great. Claire, do you want to go back to intro? Hi, yeah, thanks. Uh, hope everyone enjoyed the film. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our moderator, uh, Parisa Neruzzi. Uh, Parisa co-founded uh, the, the Citywide Community Organizing Group in Power DC in 2003. Uh, her organization works to build the confidence, self-advocacy, and, and organize political power of low to moderate income DC residents. Uh, with a focus on fighting displacement in the context of DC's intense gentrification over the last two decades. Uh, Empower DC has fought with residents to prevent public, public school closures and the elimination of public housing. They've also uh, helped to document and preserve the history of longstanding Black communities in DC uh, and led a successful environmental justice lawsuit uh, that halted the operation of a polluting bus depot at the site of a historic Black school in a neighborhood that already suffered from high asthma rates. This is in Ivy City. Uh, and when I asked Parisa if she would provide me with a letter of support for my grant proposal to fund this program, she wrote to me that Julius Hobson was, quote, one of the heroes that influenced my early activism in DC, and that it was through the work of Sam Smith, uh, one of tonight's panelists, that she, quote, learned about Hobson's bold leadership and innovative tactics. So needless to say, I was thrilled that Parisa said yes to moderating this panel tonight. Everybody, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Sarah and Katie for putting this together. And I'm, I'm really excited to hear from the panelists. So I won't talk long, but I have to say, I don't, I guess with my, my screen, it's hard to see, but this is the book that Sam wrote that introduced me to uh, Julius Hobson. And I was very lucky early in my time um, as a local organizer to, to find him in his uh, DuPont Circle office and get a, a fresh copy of it since then I've bought most of them off uh, online, the ones the available uh, used out of print. So we're gonna hear from these great panelists and learn more about um, our great hero, Julius Hobson. Uh, Cortland Cox joins us. He's, he is chair of the SNCC Legacy Project Board. When Cox arrived at Howard University in 1960, he joined the Nonviolent Action Group, NAG, one of the campus chapters of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. SNCC was committed to fighting segregation and white supremacy across America. At Howard, where there was a long history of organizing for civil rights, Cox met students such as Stokely Carmichael. With Carmichael and other members of NAG, he became involved in sit-ins along Route 40, the major highway from Washington to New York, as well as demonstrations in, in DC and on Maryland's Eastern Shore. In an interview for the Library of Congress's Civil Rights History Project, Cox described NAG as quote unquote shock troops for Julius Hobson, who called on the group whenever he needed people to join him for a protest. Hobson was around 40 years old at the time and frequently relied on college students from Howard and other schools in DC to provide the people power he needed for staging pickets and rallies. We're also joined by Sam Smith, who I just mentioned, a native Washingtonian who grew up in Georgetown co-founded the DC Statehood Party in 1970 and backed Julius Hobson's successful run uh, as a Statehood Party candidate for DC's first elected council in 1973. Smith had begun his post-college career in DC as a radio news reporter. In 1966, he worked for then future mayor, Marion Barry, who led DC's uh, chapter of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Smith later founded the newspaper Capital East Gazette, which was renamed the DC Gazette and was a leading journalistic voice against a plan uh, backed by the Washington Post to build freeways throughout DC. Smith's 1974 book, which I showed you, Captive Capital, 
colonial life in modern Washington is an authoritative source for understanding the culture and politics of local DC and includes an overview of Julius Hobson's career as an activist. Much of Smith's profoundly insightful and humor, humorous observations on Hobson, DC statehood, the freeway fight and local politics are also available online. So make sure you check him out. Uh, we're also joined by Patricia McGuire. She's been the president of Trinity University since 1989 and began her career after law school as the project director for the street law clinical program at Georgetown and later became a dean and adjunct professor there. Among the many, many honorary degrees and accolades, she's received the 2019 um, Visionary Award from the Washington Area Women's Foundation. Uh, in, in 2000, President McGuire was appointed by DC Mayor Anthony Williams and the DC Financial Control Board to a special term on the Education Advisory Committee overse overseeing DC public schools. Dr. McGuire was a legal intern for Julius Hobson when she was a student at Georgetown University's Law School. She was assigned to research and draft Hobson's Educational Accountability Act of 1977, which would have required the school board to report to the DC Council. And finally, we're joined by Frederick W. w. Gooding Jr., AKA Dr. G, a historian and associate professor of African-American studies within the John V. Roach Honors College at Texan, Texas Christian University. His research and teaching focuses on African-American history and critical race theory, as well as media, movies, and mainstream sports. Dr. G is the author of the 2018 book, American, American Dream Deferred, Black Federal Workers in Washington, DC, 1941 to 1981, which discusses the long and difficult struggle of black federal government employees to gain professional standing and career advancement. In his book, Gooding discusses Julius Hobson's role as an advocate for federal workers who were confined to lower pay grades and denied promotions. In the spirit of Hobson, who was himself an economist and, and meticulously documented evidence to back his work, Gooding provides a wealth of data to make his case. Hobson would love his book. So we're very pleased to have our speakers and I'm gonna uh, go ahead and um, ask uh, Cortland Cox to, to start off with his uh, opening statements about uh, Julius Hobson. Thank you very much. And I, I wanna give a shout out before I begin to Marilyn Robinson who was a, a, a very good journalist who worked, I think, at WRC. Uh, watching that film made me feel, I mean, this was my life. These are all the people I knew. And uh, I felt very good about it. When I look at Julius Hobson, uh, he was very unique for that particular time because Julius, I mean, as Stokely said, Julius did his research. Uh, he did. He did study, and he did uh, try to understand the environment that he was in. Most people who came to the movement at that point came because of outrage, because of some incident that had happened to them, and they felt that they needed to protest. While and so what they had before them was what they it was impacted by, what they were impacted by. They didn't see all the reasons they were impacted by that. And Julius and people like Ms. Hamer and people like W.B. Du Bois and people like Paul Robeson understood the whole societal reasons that that person was impacted. I think the second thing that made Julius, uh, you know, distinct, distinct in Washington is that in, in Washington, in just on the racial issues, um, you know, at that point, early up to that point, the NAACP was the leading uh, or civil rights organization. And the Congress of Racial Equality and, and SNCC decided that we would not just engage in court actions, we would take it to the streets. And we would take it to the streets, whether it was sit-ins, whether it was freedom rides, whether it was demonstrations against housing, whether it was demonstrations against the multitude of things that existed here. And that's why Julius and, and, and Hobson and, and Snick got along. I mean, well, I guess Nag at that point got along so well because we, I mean, he was 40 years old. Most of us were 19 and 20. 
but we understood and we saw that this was a, a deep issue that went beyond what we saw before us. People like Ms. Baker told us what we were dealing with was more than a hamburger. We were dealing with an economic and racial system that really was designed to exploit the many and for the benefit the few. And while we didn't understand that Julius did about socialism and Marx and Engels and all these kinds of things, we understood that this was a deep issue and that we had to deal with it. And we were, as Stokely said in the film, Simpatico. And the last thing I'd like to say is this. In the early 60s, uh, Black people were only supposed to, first of all, they were not supposed to speak. Uh, and when they spoke, they, they were only supposed to speak to issues of civil rights. And when people like Julius Hobson started talking about the Vietnam War, when even Martin King started talking about the Vietnam War, they were always asked by the white community, including the Washington Post and the New York Times and, and a bunch of other people, how dare you speak outside of your lane? They tried to tell us what we could say and when we could say it and why we could say it. So my sense is why people ask the question, well, why is he always mad? Why was he so always so vocal? Because it took that kind of energy to make a difference. And so we'll talk later on about other issues, but I'll stop there. That's tonight and look forward to hearing more. Um, I do wanna ask now Sam Smith to make some opening statements about his friend, Julius Hobson. Uh, unmute yourself, Sam. I um, got involved in, with Julius in a sort of an offbeat way. In 1970, I wrote an article about uh, how DC could become a state without a constitutional amendment. And the total reaction I got to the article was that somebody sent me $5 and said, if anything happens to this, give this to the cause. And I said, well, there's another one down the drain. And four months later, I'm sitting in the basement of a church with a bunch of people planning a non-voting delegate uh, campaign for Julius Hobson. And we talked about his campaign for a little while. And then he says, he says, well, what am I going to run on? And some guy in the back of the room said, well, you know, Sam wrote this interesting article about how DC could become a state. And we talked about it for no more than 15 minutes. And Julius said, that's it. That's what I'm running on. And that was my introduction to Julius Hobson. I think the thing that in thinking about him is that he was a leader towards new directions rather than merely a protester against old directions. And he was aided in this by the fact that he was a economist and a mathematician. I mean, he knew, understood math. And he so became a fact-based activist. And you saw this most dramatically in his fight for school integration. Um, but I think this is something that makes him a little bit different than a lot of activists because he, he was so fact-based. Um, and then he also had this touch of show business about him, as you could see in the movie. He knew how to say things succinctly in a very short period of time. And uh, one of the things he did was to drive around some of the white neighborhoods with some rats in cages on top of his car. And that wasn't too often done by uh, civil rights leaders in those days. But it was a great time I had with him. Thank you. Choir, please share some comments with us. You're still on mute. Patricia, yes, if you could speak now. On me, okay. okay. I'm sorry, I just had a hard time. Well, uh, good evening uh, to everyone. And I see many friends um, on the screen here and thank you for including me. I I I'm a, a, a little bit different uh, among these panelists. Um, Carissa mentioned I 
met Julius Hobson um, when I was a law student at Georgetown a hundred million years ago, it feels like, um, in the mid 1970s. Um, but the story is even a, a little bit different. And he was one of the magnets who really pulled me in to DC education. Um, when I was a law student, um, I uh, had taught street law in my second year of law school, and it was my introduction to the DC public schools. And I began to understand what some of the educational challenges were in our local public schools by teaching the law course that year. Um, and the following year, then I had the opportunity to have an internship um, and I was assigned to work with Julius Hobson. I had heard of him and I had also followed the creation of the new council immediately after the creation of the Home Rule Act. Um, and uh, so I went to meet with um, uh, Council Member Hobson and also um, his uh, then legislative aide, Pat Miner. Um, and they said, oh, we want you to do research uh, on legislation for educational accountability. Well, that touched uh, my heart because I had taught in the schools the prior year. Uh, I thought educational accountability sounded like a good idea. I was so naive, I had no idea of the political hornet's nest um, I was stepping into. Uh, and of course, um, Council Member Hobson did not feel the need to explain that to me. Um, so I went off and did the research and drafted legislation, the Educational Accountability Act of 1977. And um, the minute he introduced it, of course, all hell broke loose because uh, what it uh, intended to do was to have uh, the DC school board report to the council and have the council exercise oversight over the schools. Um, it was fascinating. Uh, the um, political uh, storm that erupted after that over who had the power uh, to oversee the schools uh, was fascinating. Um, he called hearings, but the school board would not come to testify. Uh, the uh, then superintendent, uh, that was the period of the transition from Barbara Sizemore to Vincent Reed in the superintendency. Uh, there were so many notable actors then, all struggling to figure out how do we improve education for children in the district and at the heart of it was Julius Hobson. Um, unfortunately, uh, while I was working on that project, he passed away. Um, so we never uh, completed uh, that particular round. But um, as somebody said earlier here, quoting Debbie, uh, that anyone who has the opportunity to meet and work with Julius Hobson was forever changed. And I felt that he left a lasting impression with me. I am devoted to education, have been for the rest of my professional life in the city. Um, and he is one of the notable figures who has definitely shaped my educational philosophy. And we still need to work on educational accountability. That crusade that he had is far from over. So I'll have to be happy to come back to that a little later. So much, Pat, appreciate that. Uh, Dr. G, you're up next. All righty, thanks for the baton uh, and thanks for the invitation. It's glad, I'm glad to be here with you all. Um, I would like to first of all, give a shout out to the MLK branch of the DC Public Library, the Washingtoniania Division. Uh, that is where I indeed was able to find uh, many of the papers where I was able to, to learn about Julius Hobson. So shout out to uh, Brother Derek Gray, librarian, for uh, all the care and assistance for being able to learn about this interesting uh, historical character. And so um, in terms of my portion, I just have 10 uh, historical factoids that I thought would be interesting for people to um, you know, digest. First of all, understand that when you talk about Maverick for Justice, Hobson was a Maverick ever since birth, if you think about it, he was actually one of two twins that was born to his mother. However, the tragic story is she was having complications and they had to drive to the colored hospital. Remember Jim Crow was a very real thing, still is in existence if you listen to Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow. But the idea is that back in the day, you know, it was very much, you know, physically segregated. Well, I guess still is today in many ways, not to get off the point. The point is that his twin passed away and he always felt his mother was quote, never right after that. And so he would use the pain that his mother carried with him, her, as a way to motivate him throughout life. So ever since birth, I mean, just think about how he just came out the womb already born into a world of conflict based upon race. And so, you know, in many ways he was ordained to, to, to speak to this and confront this. And so um, the, the second factoid is that um, he was 
born in Alabama, and he was actually Christian at the same 16th Street Baptist Church that was bombed, that killed the four little girls. And so think about how from the formative stages of his life, he's having to confront this idea of racism and all of his ugly manifestations. And so it's no secret or surprise that later on in life that he would be quite adamant, right, as Cox has said, about confronting this in a very direct and express and explicit manner. He wasn't going to sugarcoat, you know, or, or, or soft shoe it. He was going to speak directly to something that he knew was very violent and um, disruptive. Uh, third point is that at Howard University, um, he, uh, you know, first studied Marxism. Um, he had a, a professor at Howard University from Germany who introduced him to the concept. And the reason why it was appealing to him was uh, not that so much that he was into to communism or anything, but it was this idea that Marxism provided an alternate critique against capitalism, right, in, in terms of its relationship to racism, right, and how, you know, it essentially oppresses, you know, how the powerful oppress you know, those who don't have the means. And by the way, um, if you hear any noises or if it looks as if I'm in my car, it's because I am in my car. I'm taking on the spirit of Hobson and trying to make it happen by some way, you know, make a way out of no way. I, I had a family obligation and the timing just did not work out where I could get to my office. But the fact of the matter is, is that we make time for what's important. So point number four, um, even though he had a college degree, he still entered the federal workforce as an entry level desk attendant. So again, this goes to show how back in the day that, um, you know, uh, how education wasn't valued for all people. And so this is, again, part of what fueled him to make what was wrong right. Um, also, I'd just like to point out uh, factoid number five, that with the Hobson v. Hansen case that was mentioned earlier, he actually did all the research, right? He actually hired William Kunstler, uh, who famously argued against uh, burning of a flag being a First Amendment, but he actually did all the research and, and Kunstler was actually one who actually argued in court. Um, next, uh, you should know that uh, Hobson was not new to this. He was true to this. He was part of over 80 picket lines, uh, you know, picketed over 120 retail uh, stores. And he ended up uh, having a hand in over 5,000 blacks, uh, you know, obtaining jobs that they otherwise were not able to have. So that is tremendous this when you look at those numbers alone and uh and also i'd just like to add that um even though things didn't work out in terms of him uh staying with core for the long term he eventually uh essentially set up his one-man band uh, all he said he needed was like six people in a phone booth um and so when he, when he did um you know he formed the group act and so that was when he did most of his advocacy for government workers um number seven i believe is that uh because he was so very good at math, he was painfully aware of what we call black collar jobs. These were jobs that were um, categorized by low wages and slower raises. And this is what he definitely advocated against having been a victim of this, starting off at a low desk entry position despite having a college degree. Um, the other piece I'd like to speak to what Sam Smith mentioned um, was that he was very savvy in manipulating the media. So when you talk about why is he driving around town with rats on top of his car, it was part of what he staged as a rat relocation rally. So what happened was rats were rampant all over uh, black parts of DC. So what he said was, it's not a problem unless it's a white problem. So what he did was he he, used, he got some he went to Sears, got some uh, traps, and, and he, it was only about ten to twelve rats. But he called the media and staged this big rat relocation rally and went to Georgetown, driving slowly, claiming that he was going to unload all the rats in the, in the white part of town. Lo and behold, the problem got solved very quickly, right? And so again, that was just his savvy way of bringing the media in to leverage his voice. He also uh, set up a parabolic uh, microphone on top of his uh, car, drove around in neighborhoods, you know, uh, recording officers in, in terms of their uh, uh, abusive, uh, you know, language and, and verbiage and, and harsh invective uh, towards uh, black citizens. And then he would actually uh, 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 stage rallies. He actually used his friend, uh, Stokely Carmichael colleague, who used to babysit for his uh, younger kid, Julius Hobson Jr., who I think is on call. And, uh, and then he would actually play the recordings. Think about how forward thinking this is. This is before iPhones. This is before recording and things of that nature, you know, Spotify, YouTube, and, uh, you know, TikTok, whatever. And so he was using technology as a way to embarrass the cops who actually showed up to do a security detail. 
right? You know, so again, it's a very fascinating way in terms of how you would uh, leverage, uh, you know, technology. So the last factoid I have for you is, um, and then, you know, we, we can, uh, you know, uh, return, is I'd like to just share with you what the Washington Post said upon his passing. So when he died in 1973, the Washington Post eulogized him as a man who made a career of impatience of speaking when other men held back. The obituary concluded, right, check this out. He was outrageous, inflammatory, melodramatic, insulting. A lot of the time, he was also right. Mm. That's Julius Hobson. Uh, it was invigorating to hear <laughs> all of his work. I want to um, invite everybody on this um, event right now to submit your, your questions to the panelists through the chat, and we will do our best to read those questions. Um, I'm very tempted to ask our panelists, who of today's DC politicians would Julius Hobson call, uh, what was it? colorless, tasteless, and odorless. <laughs> I'm very tempted, I wanna know that. Um, but I'm gonna start um, going back with, if, with Cortland, if you don't mind, Cortland. Um, you know, you talked about his, uh, his research and his fact-based action. Can you talk a little bit more about how he influenced you and other young activists at Howard at that time? Well, I think that, um... You know, most of the actions that were going on really were in the South. And they were dealing with, you know, questions of voting and questions of, of you know, um, the ability to do a number of things, you know, mainly public accommodations and so forth. What Julius was able to do was be able to act in an urban area, which was uh, important uh, in, in the sense that he took on the question of education and the track system. The question of education is still, as somebody said, still a big problem, the quality education. And basically, whether we were talking about the North or the South, I mean, in the South, you had sharecropper education. In the North, you had track system and vocational education. And, and the ability to define that clearly was something that was very, very important in terms of what uh, Julius was doing. And I think what my sense was that he uh, was able to figure out how to function in an urban environment. Uh, one of the things that we did call, we used to call Julius, we used to call him Julius Hollywood Hobson. And, and we did <laughs> that because of some of the things that were explained, whether you were taking stuff to the, you know, the rats to, to Georgetown, or whether you describe somebody as colorless, odorless, and some other less. Uh, I mean, he, he had a way with words. So, I mean, I think that the things that we learned from him probably most was how do you function in an urban environment with a number of sophisticated things, particularly things like the Washington Post, who tried to define you, who tried to define you as other. I mean, that is you, be, you begin to understand. I mean, because in the South, you understood it was a whole system, but the Washington Post pretended and people like that pretended they weren't like that. But what they were was they were the cousins to the people in the South. I wonder, Sam, um, would you be able to speak any more to Julius's use of agitation, you know, you, you mentioned the rat action, which of course was, was meant to uh, make people uncomfortable. Can you, can, you, can you share any other examples of how he used agitation and uh, actions that, that really took people out of their comfort zone in his, uh, in his activism? And un unmute yourself, Sam. I think you saw that in the, in the uh, film. Uh, rather dramatically. I mean, it was, he used language very much in this sort of way, but he also found different ways to uh, attack a problem. Uh, classic example being in the school's uh, desegregation. And um, one thing that we should keep in mind, I think, as we discuss this, I was um, 
after our rehearsal last week, I picked up a Kindle version of Dr. G's book and found it very interesting about the role of the federal government and its uh, failures in terms of um, black employment. And I think it's important to know that DC was a different sort of place for a number of reasons, that being one of them. But the other, which was on the positive side was Howard University. Uh, and I think that we tend to underrate the important historically of Howard University. Um, along the lines of education, I did want to ask Pat, um, you know, as somebody who's very much uh, a leader in education today, what, what do you think, is there a remnant of, of Hobson's legacy that you still see today in activism around education in the city? And what of the issues um, that we're impacted by here in the city today in education do you think Hobson would be most inclined to, uh, to tackle? Well, first of all, I, I, I wish he had lived and I wish um, he had been successful in getting the legislation enacted. And I say that not because of what I knew in 1977 as a law student, uh, but what I know today in 2020 as a college president. Uh, you may know Trinity enrolls more DC residents than any other private uh, university in, in town. Um, and most of our students are from wards four, five, seven, and eight. Um, and as much as uh, we work with the DC public schools, and I certainly uh, love and cherish um, both our students and the teachers who are working so hard, um, I, I do not think um, that the way uh, it worked out for the schools with mayoral control uh, was necessarily the direction Julius Hobson would have gone to be sure. Uh, and it's not clear that that is the best direction at all. I think the spirit of having um, uh, people uh, the people more engaged with their schools lives uh, in the city and the, the education councils in, in uh, some of the ANCs, some of the community activists, some of the parent groups. Um, but the fact is that um, once uh, the reform occurred, when was it in 2007, 2008, when Adrian Fenty took over the schools um, and brought in Michelle Ree, uh, it was a, a sea change. Um, it disempowered the school board entirely. So back in 77, the school board was worried that if it reported to the council, it would be disempowered. Um, but then, you know, uh, fast forward 20 or 30 years, uh, the council or the school board became almost irrelevant. Um, and that's not necessarily good for the long term. Um, I think our chancellors work hard. You know, I mean, this is not pointing a finger at anybody. Um, but I think we still have many um, educational challenges in the city. And I think some of that is structural. Um, I, I do not see the kind of activism um, that Julius Hobson brought. Um, uh, when, when he died, there was a column by uh, Bill Raspberry in the Washington Post uh, that I remember also. And this relates to tactics, because everybody today, you know, tactics get, gets bleached through 100 million consultants, you know. Well, Hobson didn't use consultants. He just did what his gut told him was the right thing to do, which is why he was a disruptor. Um, and he, he actually told Bill Raspberry and was quoted, at the end of the day, he didn't care whether the, the schools, uh, the school board reported to the council or, or whoever, he just wanted education to be improved. Um, and he was gonna try whatever tactic uh, would be sufficiently disruptive to call attention uh, to the fact that education was not uh, improving fast enough. Um, I think he'd still be saying that today. I think he would be as impatient today uh, with where um, the schools are as he was back then. Uh, the progress, there's been some progress, but not fast enough. You actually making a comment about mayoral control and speaking your mind about that, because, you know, even that in and of itself, a lot of people uh, who work in education are in the realm, maybe afraid to even just say, hey, this may not be the right thing, you know, but, but certainly appreciate that. That was very Hobbesian of you to, to speak the truth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm an old soul. I say a lot of things that are on my mind and people are just like, there she goes again. I think, I think he influenced me a little bit that way. I see it. Thank you. Um, Dr. G, I really appreciated how you brought in that early history and that, that, the, 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 um, the, the, the stuff that you told us about his twin, of course, and, and you, you said he was almost ordained really, you know, from birth to deal with these issues of racial injustice. And I, you know, it was interesting because I felt like some people were sort of portraying him as though he was um, 
you know, just very intellectual and not so much emotional. But in the film, you also saw Miss Mallory. And she said, when I told him about my husband, he cried. I don't know if you all picked up on that. He said he yeah. cried, he was touched. So I wondered if, did you pick up anything else about this nuance between, you know, being very intellectual, being very fact-based as, as well as being an emotional person. Um, and also this, this nuance between being atheist, but obviously being a great man of faith in humanity and our ability to create change. I thought that that was also really interesting as well. Absolutely. First of all, let me apologize. I did misspeak. Uh, he did leave us and pass away in 1977, not 1973. I think a, a you know, absent my professor. But um, to, to your question, I, I think that he did, in fact, have a balancing of the two, you know, the logic and the emotion. I mean, after all, when you think about the Hobson v. Hansen case, it was fueled by what? Him passing this school that was closest to him by residence with his son. And, you know, he's, he's passing the school with his son. And he's like, this doesn't make any sense. I'm, I'm walking a further distance to the segregated school. This has got to stop. This, this is not practical. So I, I think, um, you know, you know that, that comes from him being emotionally connected to his own family, right? You know, his own child, right? In, in his own neighborhood. Right, you know, and this idea of how, how it actually felt to him. It wasn't as if he was just sitting up in the office and just, you know, throwing darts at the wall about I, I want to be a rabble rouser. You know, what what should I pick next to agitate over? No, I mean he was very much connected to the work, and I think that's what made his uh, advocacy so very strong. And, and going back to the government worker piece, I mean, he lived the life, right, as someone who was overqualified and was essentially stunted by a system that was not recognizing, um, you know, the true value of black labor. And I, I think, you know, that, that, that being able to channel that emotion and couple it with the statistical data to show that no matter what type of educational background that an African-American usually had, that they were often still stunted. They were labeled as a black collar worker. I think he was able to merge the two. And so I think um, in many ways, you know, when you, you combine the two, what, what, what makes for a, a very more powerful argument is that it's not just you're angry, but it's, but it, but it's more of a pointed critique based upon that which is logically sound and fueled by righteous indignation, right? This idea that we should be satisfied with a quote unquote good government job. No, th this was something that absolutely roiled him. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that why shouldn't anyone in this country have the opportunity to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness unbridled without any type of, you know, cap or, you know, any, any, any type of, uh, you know, uh, glass ceiling. And so, I mean, after all, you have white teenagers making millions on TikTok, but yet as a black government worker, I should be so happy uh, over this idea that now I have benefits, even though my salary will be forever capped, right? You know, I mean, if I'm, if, I mean, the highest I can go is a GS-16, you know, maybe SES. And so I think, by him being able to combine the emotion and the logic, I think you know we, we need to revise how we how we how we char characterize individuals like him using words like angry, irritated. I, I think d d does the advocacy a disservice. Uh, so I, I prefer this idea of righteous indignation. This idea mm -hmm. that it was very much informed critique, you know, based upon that which was logical and sound. Because after all, uh, in conclusion, anger is a natural human emotion but uh, if anything you know. if, if anything well I was gonna say, if anything there is cases in where it is logical to be upset over what is happening to you or to your community i'm sorry go ahead sam yeah i was just gonna say that uh, righteous indignation is very righteous but uh without solutions it doesn't isn't very effective and i think that uh, sometimes these days i get the sense that activism is sort of like what you see with some offspring of dysfunctional families. Uh, they live their whole lives with the evil of the past, but without coming up with any ways to, to change that. And that was one of the big differences with someone like Hobson. He took it someplace else. 
I, I want to ask you, um, maybe you could share with us what, what was the relationship like between Julius Hobson and um, Marion Barry? And now we're getting into some of the questions that have come through the chat. So keep those coming. We'll try to keep them. Yeah, I, I don't think I can help you too much on that because my experience with those two guys were, were a little bit uh, off. I, I got involved with Marion in, I think, about 1966. And um, uh, I, of course, when he came, became mayor, I sort of got different views. Uh, he once called me a cynical cat, which I think is one of the highest honors I've ever gotten to come from Marion Barry. But, <laughs> but I don't know much about their relationship, the two of them. I mean, both of them were scientists. Well, I mean, Julius was a mathematician. Uh, Marion was a chemist. Yeah. Uh, in fact, you know, Marion did not do his dissertation for a PhD in chemistry. So, I mean, both of them understood, you know, science and, and did a number of things and organized their, their ways. I think Sam puts it, you know, as they, you try to look forward. I mean, one of the things, I just want to say one thing about something that Sam said about today's youth. You know, I find out that, and I find, I think, you know, that when people discover, when young people discover the, the hypocrisy in the, the, that exists, when you have the verbiage talking about life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and the kind of constraints that's put upon them, you know, there is always this outburst. But as I think they try to make a way out of the, the of really no way, they begin to become much more sophisticated. Uh, they begin to take on and understand that they need to study, they need to begin to think through, uh, you know, how you move forward. Now, what happens is as that group moves forward and understands, there is always a new group coming behind it. So when you look at today, you know, the one group was Trevon Martin, and Michael Brown and so forth that happened in Ferguson. And another group, after these guys become more sophisticated, you have another group coming behind them with George Floyd. So my sense is that while we see a lot of churning and disruption with today's youth, you, you also, there is a lot of sophistication being developed by various groups as they grow older. Yeah, and you know, the same injustices are the same entrenched uh, system still remains that we're up against an even more entrenched system now. So just remember that, you know, I think in some ways, um, unfortunately, things haven't improved as much as, as they should have over this time and actually have gotten worse, these issues of income inequality and, you know, racial inequality. So I think that's part of the challenge is figuring out what is the solution at this point. Um, Teresa, uh, this is Pat. Can I just make one other observation before yes. moving on? Uh, I think it's important to remember that the first council after home rule, um, which Julius was part of and Marion Barry was part of, uh, also had a number of great activists. We are focusing on Julius Hobson, um, but he was part of a group that tried to shape uh, a, a new empowered District of Columbia. And, and you had other activists like John Wilson, um, you had Hilda Mason, um, it, you know, you had uh, Polly Shackleton, um, uh, you, you had Dave Clark. Um, I mean, it was a powerful group of activists, uh, not just one, but many. He was, um, Julius was, uh, you know, very uh, uh, top of the heap, if you will. Um, Marion Barry was still a young man at that time um, and had not, uh, come into his um, his mayorship yet, uh, but there were a lot of extraordinary um, figures in that council in 1994 through uh, 97, you know, 77, 78 uh, in the 70s, and um, we don't have figures like that today. I think is my point. Um, yeah, it was we don't nine see out of thirteen. Of nine Pardon? out of thirteen of the first city council members were activists. Yeah, yeah, they they were extraordinary. So I have to then ask this question about how would Julius Hobson characterize today's city council <laughs> and today's politicians, today's mayor? Uh, Anybody? Portland? What would the terms he used? Colorless, odorless? <laughs> I mean, my, pro my problem is, and somebody mentioned uh, Fenty 
you know, in um, what happened with the school board and so forth. And, and remember in 08, it was a very a vicious period. I mean, the Washington Post was carrying on, I mean, and trying to, re anybody who would try to challenge Fenty, they would, you know, try to drum them out. And the reality is that he, here's a guy who won every precinct against Linda uh, Kraut, 136 out of 136. And the next time he lost, because the reason he lost is because he felt the need to disrupt the educational system, destroy teachers, destroy, you know, all of that because he was told by people in New York that this is what you have to do in order to gentrify the city, in order to make the city better, in order to bring in different people. And people weren't gonna come in and, and deal with the city unless the school systems were different. So my sense is I'm not, I have not seen, and there may be, I could be wrong. I have not seen anyone on the council who has challenged the kind of exploitation that really is much more modern and sophisticated and much more defined as betterment. But it really, as the old days we used to say, you know, urban renewal it was Negro removal. And that is what's happening. And I don't see anybody making challenges to that discussion. I'm gonna read one more question and then I think we should um, ask some of our special guests to speak a little bit as well. Um, the question is, could Dr. G or others uh, please explain how things got so bad in DC by the 1960s where things had reached a state as Eleanor Holmes Norton described it of apartheid and prominent African-American leaders in the early 20th century claimed DC was unusually oppressive for Afri African-Americans. This is what Julius Hobson and other activists were challenging during the 60s and 70s. Please explain, was DC worse than other places? Okay, so I can jump in first on that. And I, I don't think DC was worse than other places, but DC uh, by, by the 60s was becoming more black than other places. So let's not forget that in 1971, you're talking about DC population reached the apex of 71% African-American, thereby earning the nickname, what? Say it with me, y'all, Chocolate City. It's more like a mocha swirl now, as you know, uh, due to what Cortland Cox just talked about with respect to gentrification. But I mean, I think this idea of when you look at the Great Migration, many people came up for good government jobs for the war. Um, remember, that's when you wanted black bodies, when you needed the labor, right? You know, you needed, you know, we, we remember we, you know, all, all need to pitch in for the war effort. But then all of a sudden when the war is over, uh, you still have these black bodies in the city. And then all of a sudden, what do we do? And so the idea is that as the city became much more African-American, um, that's when magically there's shifting of resources. And, and then all, 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 the, all of a sudden there's a battle about, you know, c control and, you know, and, the, and, and who, who has agency and who has the ability to determine the, you know, the future of the city. Right. I mean, I, you know, and I, I, it's not a, a stretch of the imagination to connect the dots and see how the common denominator in all these pieces here is race. So, uh, again, many people can quibble with me and, and email me later about whether race is the predominant factor. But I think many of us would be foolish to uh, state that race was not a factor. Right. And in, in, in terms of us understanding the character of the city and how people are viewing the city, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's no secret that PG County, Prince George County um, has, you know, the, the, the highest per capita, you know, income for African-Americans being that suburb, Maryland, so directly adjacent to Washington, DC in terms of the opportunities for African-Americans. And so while in many ways, DC is reflective of what's been happening in so many other urban areas, whether it be Baltimore, Philadelphia, my home city, or, you know, New York, this idea where once African-Americans are gathered in mass, Right now, all of a sudden, the, the language and the politics shifts about, you know, resources and how they should be allocated and what should be done for, for the people. So, um, you know, I, and again, when you look at the aftermath of the 1968 riots, um, you know, and the aftermath of MLK's assassination, um, you know, you, you, in many ways, when you talk about this idea of urban renewal and Negro removal, that's, that's exactly right. Um, you know, when you look at many areas of town, particularly the Northeast, where uh, there, there, there's no, uh, the, 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 
the idea of reinvesting in these neighborhoods uh, simply just did, did not match or what was not, you know, consistent, right? You know, and, and, but fast forward a few uh, decades and uh, I, I don't know if many of you, you know, in the, in the Zoom room remember, but I remember off the red line, we had a stop called Rhode Island. Right, you know, is it Rhode Island, right? You know, and that now I, I, th I think they, they changed it to North Massachusetts. So, so in other words, th there's this shifting and changing whereby um, you know uh, gentrification is now uh, pushing out uh, the, the African American imprint, um, you know, which has been so very much a, a part of the irony of the story that the nation's capital, right, has most of the workers where the face of the government is literally. African-American and, and that representative and symbolic power of that, I think plays into the comments you just heard with respect to Marion Barry, uh, Mayor Fenty and many other mayors who have been impugned uh, for, uh, you know, and, 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 and essentially have had to fight these narratives about them not being fit for leadership, them not having the ability, the intellect or the wherewithal to be able to lead a city that is mostly African-American. So again, race is absolutely a factor. And so DC is not too dissimilar from many other cities in that respect. I do want to invite um, Julius's family members who are with us to say a few words. Tina Hobson, Julius Hobson Jr. I, I believe maybe also his daughter Jean may have joined us. Um, Tina or Julius Hobson Jr., you want to unmute yourself and say a few words? Uh, it's Julius. I can't start the video, but I did unmute the microphone. Let me hear you. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, let me uh, say a, a couple of things. One, uh, uh, Dr. G, I had not heard about your book. I just ordered it on uh, on Amazon. Uh, thanks, Cortland, for your uh, your comments. Oh, and I do want to say this. Uh, yes, my sister Jean Richardson is on, as is my daughter, uh, uh, Faye Rencher and granddaughter uh, Sienna Rencher. They're they're here somewhere. Uh, I would say that uh, life was was interesting as the sun. Uh, I was when I was elected to the school board. Uh, shortly thereafter, I became uh, vice president board and chair of the finance committee. And Julius Hobson Sr. was uh, chairman of the council education committee. And more than once, I had to present the uh, board's position on our budget to. To his committee, to simply say it was an interesting hearing, and no, he didn't cut his son any slack. Uh, and I and I can say I, you know, I gave as good as I got. Uh, the other thing is, is an irony of ironies. Uh, it, you know, after he had he had passed, in an attempt to uh, fix the management of Walter Fontroy's office, he had a panel pick his chief of staff. I was Walter Fontroy's chief of staff in 83 and 84. And let me just simply say, it didn't work out and everything my father said was right. <laughs> um, and with regard to Marion, when I left uh, Fontroy's staff in 85, I became the city's in-house uh, lobbyist during Marion's second and third terms. Um, he was unique. Uh, I will simply say that Marion was always dedicated to, to making sure that things got to people. And I think that's one of the reasons, as, as Cortland pointed out, why they did everything to drum him out, which is why we got a control board, was our city finances were not that bad. Um, and, uh, you know, it, he is, his style and, and desire and commitment to people has been missed since his absence. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Okay, this is Tina Hobson. I don't know whether I'm on or not. Can hear you, you tell? yes, we hear you. Okay, uh -huh. well, I wanted to tell you that my early dates with Julius was going to uh, speak against the Vietnam War. And I often dragged my boys with us uh, because it was very important. And in 1969, uh, the Hobson v. Wilson was started uh, that involved both uh, Abe Bloom and Arthur Waskow and uh, Reverend David Eaton. And uh, we were looking at peace. Julius was as interested in peace and he was non-violent. Uh, uh, he was in Italy during World War II and he uh, went up the boot. He worked in Italy as a arterial spotter. It was a segregated black, white, 
war, uh, but he came back totally opposed to wars in solving problems. And he was not violent. He was just nonviolent, uh, even though he said other things belonged to groups that didn't say that, but I knew it from the years that we were married and I knew him from 67 and he died in 77. But I wanted to tell you that while he was in Italy because he didn't drink alcohol, at night when other people went to bars in the military, he went to the opera and he came home entertaining me with all the stories of the opera. Unfortunately, it wasn't something I dearly loved. He also, when he was up in a plane, memorized poetry, British poetry, because he had a book. So he could entertain me with British poetry. And he came back from the war with being able to talk about British poetry and opera. He was way more intelligent than I was. And I graduated from Stanford University in California. So it was fun to learn from Julius. And I did a lot. So I just wanted to thank you for doing this report because uh, he has been dead for 43 years. And the fact that his memory is, as, or is just as acute as he, I still remember him. And I just wanted to thank you for what you have done because in the first place he was fun and he was humorous and, uh, and all the things that people have said. And I'm glad to have met the people who knew him when I didn't because they have my opinion of him also. So thank you for inviting me. Did Jean or uh, anybody else from the family want to say anything? I, I don't want to exclude any family members. Or put you on the spot, but you know. <laughs> okay. If so, uh, feel free to unmute. And um, we also invite everybody, if you have a question specifically for the special guests who are speaking, for the family members and uh, our other special guests, please do put it in the chat. Uh, I wanted to ask Debbie Hanrahan then if she could share some thoughts and memories of working with Julius Hobson. Debbie, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Okay, I can hear you. Can you? Can you. Oh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you yeah. speak a bit louder, maybe a bit more into the mic? Yes. Okay. okay, there we um, go. First of all, um, uh, it's probably the most interesting job I've ever had and I'm an old lady and I've had a lot of jobs. Um, it was dumb luck that got me into his office, but it certainly set the direction of my entire life. And I want to ask you, Parissa, just think if we had Julius Hobson today to talk away uh, to talk about the runaway gentrification that is ruining our city, that is eating up our, our resources, <laughs> that is using up our, our budgets. I mean, just think if we had somebody of his power that we could all work with and follow because there is this vacuum now in the midst of an enormous problem. I mean, uh, I mean, it's just, it confronts us at every level. And I, I miss him so much. And I, I wanna add something that my husband observed that we talk about an inside outside approach to activism. You have people in the courts, that's the inside approach. Then you have the outsiders the people on the streets, the people who are demonstrating, the people who are sitting in. Julius did both of them. Can you think of any other or any other leader today. in our, today or even then who had mastered both approaches and was, and, and was ex successful with both approaches? But Parisa, please talk about gentrification for a minute because it is the runaway ill of our times. You know, what struck me with the, the film was some of his last comments in there. He talked about how he was just as uh, outspoken against black politicians yes. exploitation of black yes. residents as he was white politicians. Right. And you know, that's something that I'm, 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 un, I'm afraid is really lacking in the city. I think that you know, we, uh, we somehow want to act like it's not a you know, first of all, that racism is not a problem because we have black elected officials. Well, of course it is. And systemic racism is a major problem. But also that uh, with that we we don't have actual um, 
you know, we have a, a class a class problem as well, which is which I think existed when when Julius was doing this work as well, which is that, you know, we have a certain group of black politicians that are looking down on a lot of our existing black residents and acting as though their pain is not real right. or that somehow right. their pain is just it, it, it it's OK because the city is going to, you know, is, is progressing in some way. Um, and and I think that Julius would would have I agree with you I didn't have the pleasure of knowing him but I think he would have been incensed and outspoken and that's the other thing that I really appreciated seeing is how he was not concerned with um, you know he, in fact what he said about if I meet my maker the only thing I'm going to be embarrassed by is that I wasn't more misbehaved you know that I behaved too well right. and I think that that right. was um, given the circumstances he said right given right. the circumstances I've behaved too well and I think that that's a mantra that we all need to right. take to heart because you know, if we are not being disruptors then really what are we doing right, right. right. Mm -hmm. and first if, if I could just jump in to, to comment on what you're saying yeah. that I, I think him studying Marxism um, you know, as early on in his career, I think was was very, very important in terms of just having a different critique and analysis of this idea of capitalism, because the problem with capitalism in terms of it, how it operates, it doesn't discriminate ironically in terms of race. In other words, if you can have black, you can have black indigenous people of color in these positions still operating this machinery in a way that is still destructive to black indigenous and people of color. So, so what do I mean? And I think, I think when you look at, for example, um, just recent current events, many of us on this call would have found it very difficult to for, foresee the day in which Barack Obama would have been elected in 2008. How revolutionary was that, right? But mm -hmm. at the same time, when, uh, I think we, uh, Cortland Cox may, may, may mention some of these names. When you think about uh, Michael Brown, when you think about Oscar Grant, when you think about, right, Trayvon Martin, oh, oh, wait a minute. These were people who ended up being the genesis of hashtag Black Lives Matter that started on whose? Obama's watch, right? So just because you have a black face in a high place, that doesn't mean that you exactly. revolutionized the system, right? So, so in other words, the system was still operating as it was designed to do. Right, which is and, and unfortunately destructive for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So just because Obama was in office, that, that didn't stop the show. And I right. think Hobson and his advocacy reminds us of how we have to remain consistent, right? You know, in, in terms of our critique and critically analyzing how the whole is affected, right? You know, and, and so and I think you know the only travesty is, uh, and I think Ms. Tina Hobson said it, this idea that 43 years later. His advocacy is still as acute. Well, the, 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 I guess my only question is, why does it take us 43 years to realize, right? You know, and, and in terms of, you know, oftentimes, so many time outliers, um, you know, during the time period in which, you know, they're advocating is, is difficult for people to, to really understand and embrace them. It's only after the fact where we say, oh, wow, I, I th you know, they, they, they must have been on to something, you know, they, they, they made a really great point. And, and but oftentimes, you know, the window has closed. And so, you know, when you look at now the city of DC and, and the justification that's talking place, I mean, hell, I mean, maybe even, you know, Mocha Swirl is, you know, too generous, you know, it's, it's looking more vanilla by the day. And, and, and so, you know, it, the idea is that how can we be mindful of the advocacy of Hobson in today's era right. and, and, and recognize it and respect it as opposed to recognizing it some, you know, time hence. Right. Could, could I just interject one more thing? Josephine Butler, we were throwing names into the hat and we must never forget Josephine Butler. Um, but uh, Tina had mentioned something to me, which I had talked to her about. And that gets back to your point about truth to power. Yeah, right. Hobson never hesitated to talk truth to power, including the, whoever. And that's what we don't have today. We are we are trimming our we are trimming our sails, and he never did that, and that is what's getting us into trouble. Well, and and if I could jump in here just for a minute, because uh, the topic of gentrification, much on my mind. Um, we had Dr. Andre Purry talk at at noon today at Trinity about um, uh, the home ownership issue um, and you know the problem of of 
uh, the, the wealth gap, uh, the black-white wealth gap. Um, and we were talking about solutions like paying off student debt and you know, how can we make it possible for more young uh, uh, black um, women and men to, to purchase. But the problem is, is, as we pointed out here in DC, you know, I'm up here in the Brookland Edgewood neighborhood you can't buy anything for under a million dollars right now in this neighborhood, you know, oh. where you used to be able to buy something nice for 150, 200,000. Mm -hmm. um, so even if we wipe out all the student loan debt, there's still, it still is impossible uh, to purchase a home and home ownership is one of the fastest ways a person can build wealth and, and can, can get on the wealth track. Um, the problem is there's a lack of political willpower um, when when the the politicians, um, you know, and I don't want to name names, but uh, when in fact um, the the politicians are co-opted by the developers, if you will, when there is uh, a refusal to discuss issues of poverty and racism, you know, and systemic racism in home ownership um, and how decisions get made about land use in the city, um, then you are in fact putting yourself in a position where not only is it impossible um, for the rising generation uh, of black citizens in the city to own homes, in fact, the city is bleaching out. And so the city is now uh, becoming predominantly white and the, the political power structure is becoming predominantly white. Um, so you actually lose power even as the city's uh, surface economically is improving. Um, it's, it's a subject that our students at Trinity are very interested in and very concerned about. Um, and the question becomes, where is the next Julius Hobson? You know, where is that political spine to call out what needs to be called out? Can you make progress economically as a city together while not leaving so many of your citizens behind? And, and I don't know who is caring for the citizens being left behind right now. Um, I think Chris is trying to do her best. <laughs> well, Parissa. Yeah. Well, I'm not an elected office. I think Trayon White is probably trying to do his best, but he's up against a, a big tide. And, and, you know, we have this problem of um, just a real veneer, right? It's like this window dressing of racial equity. Everybody wants to talk about racial equity, but yet apply mm -hmm. it to programs that do nothing right. to actually change people's economic conditions, to actually transfer wealth, resources, and power, which is the only way we're going to be able to you know, repair the harm that's been done. I wanted to invite you all, if you have any questions for each other, I'd be curious to know, you know, if, if anybody you know, among you know, has a question for each other. Okay, I'd like to ask Debbie. Debbie, what do you mean truth to power? Uh, if you don't have an example, and I think you do, I have one. Uh, uh, Tina, feel free, I'd like to hear yours. Yeah. Well, mine were was uh, when in this whole peace issue, Joan Baez, remember, came to town and wanted to have a ring around, I think it was a ring around the uh, uh, Capitol. Mm -hmm. And so she, but then a lot of black uh, VIPs in the city got up and said, no, she can't do that because mm -hmm. what we need is money for poor black people and this costs so much money to have protesters come in and do this kind of Vietnam War protest. And it was Joan Baez. So in the end, Julius got up and said, that's, he said, the constitution says that here's where you protest. So we're going to always pay for protests. He was on the city council at that time. And uh, so uh, there, but most of the black VIPs, the leaders had said, we can't afford it. Well, you know, it, I thought I was even surprised at that. And uh, so then everybody backed down and Joan Baez had her thing. And when Julius died, she asked if she could come and sing in our apartment, mm -hmm. which I yeah. thought was very touching. So right. that was an oath to power. It doesn't matter whether you're white or black. And because Julius was interested and involved in civil rights, but also in peace. And uh, so I felt that that was very important because although there were dominant members of minorities and certainly black people in the military, there were a lot of whites and he included everybody, even though it was segregated when he was in. So this truth to power was something that I respected all his life. Right. This is Julius Jr. I wanna say something else and add on to what Tina said. 
She mentioned the court suit against the FBI. Most people don't realize how much we were under surveillance in uh, yeah. in in the '60s, and it was after that case that uh, was resolved that I got to read my FBI file, which was started when I was 14 years old. Oh my gosh! Uh, and Thank I will simply say, when uh, when I was an undergraduate, when I turned 18, the draft board was after me. So when I got to Howard. Uh, I signed up for advanced army ROTC. So I went through all four years. I came back from summer camp at Indian Town Gap military reservation and got hauled in by uh, military intelligence for two days. Uh, and they, you know, I, you thought they would ask me about whatever I'd earned a, a, a right for a regular army commission. And they spent two days asking me about my father. Uh, there yep. were a lot of us who grew up who were the sons and daughters of, of some of those first city council members. And I do have to add uh, uh, Willie Hardy and Nadine Winter in that, in that, mm -hmm. in that bunch. Yeah. Um, and, and all of them uh, were activists and all of them were always under surveillance. And, uh, and yet they, they persisted in, in, in trying to make things better. From my perch as, as working for both Fontra and the mayor, and for Marion, when he was the mayor, uh, the resistance continued. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I'm just, I think it's unfortunate we don't have that today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have, a, I have a note here from my historian wife. She says, I love it that Tina once said, the thing about Julius is he took the constitution personally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I add something to what Cortland Cox said, which is, that we had extraordinary people walking around the, around this uh, city at uh, in in the days in the early activist days the anti war days I mean uh, Mr Cox would you comment on that please or expand on that because well, that's I want really to I want to say that Julius Hobson was part of a cohort of people particularly people who came out of World War Two black soldiers who, after fighting for freedom abroad, decided that they were not going to take what they saw at home. So you're talking about Mega Evers and people like that. And so, I mean, Julius, I mean, so he wasn't just an individual. He was a cohort. Mm -hmm. We came behind you. I was 20 years younger than Julius, you know, 21, maybe something like that, you know, and, um, you know, we also saw what was going on and we learned and you know people the people who helped us understand the world as i mentioned miss hamer byard rustin you know people people like that they helped us understand the world uh and so my sense is that that we there was a clarity i mean i think you mentioned that he was did the legal he did also the the demonstration but also Julius was an intellectual. Mm -hmm. And the, the big difference with Julius as an intellectual, I don't, don't, don't take this off, you know, most intellectuals stay at the university and the academy, <laughs> but he got in the streets. And so he was a triple threat in, in the sense that he not only did that. So, you know, my sense is that the big thing that was important for us is that first, you had the cohort that challenged each other and fed off each other. So it was not only Julius was doing something here in Washington, but some else body was doing something in Mississippi. Somebody was doing something in Alabama. They took the time to, to speak to us and to help get us focused and so forth. I, I, I let me just say that while I think that between the 70s and to 2012, you had a different kind of development. You had the development of electoral politics in, in, the United, in terms of the black community. You had uh, uh, professors, you had people in business and so forth. Uh, that kind of class and so forth group developed. Now, 2012 with you know, Trevon Martin, I don't know what reasons, it started again, the whole demonstration, the whole Black Lives Matter piece. And I have a great deal of confidence that at some point, five, six, seven, eight years from now, 
there will be a group of Julius Hobson's and Marion mm -hmm. Barry's and Johnny Wilson's and Douglas Moore. Don't forget Douglas Moore. Doug, mm -hmm. Doug, Douglas Moore. There's another one. Yeah. I mean, so my sense is they're, they're coming. And I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I take heart that, you know, mm -hmm. they, that whole generation is going to be very disruptive to this society. Uh, I mean, That's even awesome. when you look at what happened after, after uh, the other day, when the WNBA, the women in WNBA decided that they were going to disrupt the whole basketball season. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, the young woman, Naomi uh, Osaka, who, you know, says, you know, she, she's being paid a lot by Japan, but she says, I'm going to respect my African roots and I am going to stop this whole piece in at the and the the U.S. Open. So there are young people I have a lot of faith in that are going to be coming, and you will be so there twenty years from now, thirty years from now. There'll be conversation like this talking about young people who've made a difference. I hope you're right. <laughs> well, I, I think backing I this up, that um, one thing that we tend to uh, ignore in something like this is we. Forget about the neighborhood, the, the, the city that supported someone like Julius Hobson. What was different about Washington at that time? I mean, I think of things like living on Capitol Hill and we had a neighborhood credit union, we had a neighborhood legal services. There was a, just a different attitude about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. well, and I, I don't like think that we should miss it in when we're talking about someone who is a, a hero of that period. Yeah, Sam, do you remember when, Ju this is my last little quick story, when Julius uh, uh, opposed the fact that the utilities would not let black people work at the counters to collect mm. payment for bills. They had to work behind the walls. So you know what Julius did, and that's why I want to say, Julius was nonviolent, regardless of what anybody thinks. He basically was nonviolent. He said, let's take our cards that have holes in them that we send our checks in to at the, in those days. You sent your check in and they sent you a card and then they hooked in on those hooks to sort them out. He said, just punch extra holes in the card <laughs> and send your check in to pay your bill. But it's based on the fact that they are treating black uh, employees different than white employees in terms of their jobs and so forth. I happily, I didn't even know Julius at the time, I, I punched holes in the cards mm -hmm. and sent them back and they then immediately, you know, they, they sued Julius uh, and uh, it became a big thing, but he won, but he was not violent. He was not mean. He was not Trump. Uh, you know, he was so, so when people think about it, don't do something violent. Do something like punching holes in the card. <laughs> Before we wrap, which we are, we're about out of time, I know that there's somebody named Gilbert Douglas on the line who wanted to say something. He was uh, in core with Julius. Um, is Gilbert still on? Mm -hmm. Would like to unmute yourself and say something briefly. Hello. Can yes, I be we hear you. Go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, this has been a very interesting discussion. Uh, I noted, though, that it has caused the period uh, really in 1967-68 when uh, I went back to college. Uh, I had been a college dropout. Uh, I'm a native Washingtonian, born here, raised here, went to Banneker when it was junior high school. And then I went away to Massachusetts for a number of years. But when I came back, I had the, I was an honorary white man, I believe. And Julius taught me what segregated Washington meant. Uh, in fact, a couple of days ago, uh, a good friend of my father's worked with him in the post office. They were both college graduates. And they led a struggle for many years to uh, get some decent jobs uh, and promotions. But uh, what impressed me most with working with Julius was I got a job in Chevy Chase at Western Avenue as a Christmas salesman in the men's department. And I uh, attributed that to some demonstrations that court had downtown with Hex Department Store and Landsberg and so forth and Woody's. And I went to a core meeting at uh, 
All Souls Unitarian Church. And uh, when the meeting was over, I said, well, I attributed Cora's prior demonstrations to my getting hired for the Christmas season. And uh, I wanted to join Cora, give him some money back. How could I pay for membership? And the whole room broke off in laughter because <laughs> there was no membership. Uh, and uh, so anyhow, I made a small donation and became a member of it. And we picketed otherwise uh, in Adams Morgan with, in front of Safeway, Columbia stores on Ro Columbia Road. I led a picket line a couple of blocks away, west of uh, that. And when we went from court to also, I uh, went to work for the State Department later. And there was a man there who was, uh, he used to be a mail deliverer within the State Department, but Julius and Cor picketed uh, an accounting school that no longer existed at 16th and L Streets. And he stopped being a mail carrier at uh, the State Department and studied accounting and he became an accountant. So there's an economic basis I could go into before Julius went into Hoppers. I know a man who promoted Julius as president of the Federation of Civic Associations, which was black homeowners across this, the country. And that's uh, a lot of what he did in economics was based on analysis of property and value. And that's intellectual as we've talked about here today. And I think it's uh, something that needs to be uh, studied more and activated more in, in today's activists. Uh, and we shouldn't invent, I worked at the, for a while at the Washington Afro newspaper with Chuck Stone who hired me and Chuck Stone and Julius would always talk. And when Chuck Julius came to the office to meet with Chuck, I asked myself, myself, why is Julius always so angry at seeing? <laughs> but uh, he had a sense of humor and uh, I've enjoyed the conversation. Um, and uh, I'll stop there. Uh, um, to tell more later another time if anybody wants to. Um, yeah, I, I do feel that this is, we're almost cutting the conversation short, um, but it is 8.30 and I, I know you all have uh, um, been with us for two hours now. So I want to ask Sarah Schoenfeld, the um, producer of this event, if she wanted to um, begin the process of closing us out. Sarah? Yes, I'm, I uh, I'm muted myself. I'm just trying to make myself visible. <laughs> ah, here we go. Sorry about that. Hi. Uh, thanks, everyone. So I just, um, if you don't mind if we just go a few minutes longer, because I have one other request um, from somebody named Richard Pollock, um, who would like to just um, very quickly say something, and then I think we were, we'll, we'll close it out, um, since we're at 832 right now. Richard, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Can you see yeah. me? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, I was honored to have been a co-plaintiff with Julius against in a lawsuit, a civil rights lawsuit against the FBI and the Metropolitan Police Department. And I think that Tina uh, mentioned this in passing. So Julius was a man who also believed in privacy and the FBI and the Metropolitan Police Department had spied and infiltrated on political activists, both civil rights activists. I was an anti-war activist, a very young anti-war activist. And he filed a lawsuit, which is called Hobson versus Wilson, mm -hmm. in which he challenged. Oops. Whoa. I didn't touch anything. No, I know you didn't. Hi there. Brings on us, I think. Yeah. You think you can get him back on? You froze, Richard. Remember, Hobson v. Wilson lasted 12 years. It was a from 19. 69 to 1981, when they were forced to pay us or pay some of the people who demonstrated, which I'm not sure the, the FBI had ever done that before. So you can, we can still think of things that people haven't done that Julius would think of. And I wish everybody well, because I think we're going to continue caring. And thank you. I want to thank you. I wish we could get him back on because I'd like to hear him. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Tina has spoken to me about how influential that case was and that I think it, um, that it was actually the individual uh, person, members of the FBI that, that had to be sued, right. as I understand. Um, the FBI. Right. 
So uh, thank you so much, everybody. I um, would invite you to contact me. Uh, I know that there, there are people that are trying to make some, some connections tonight because we've got you know, a lot of family members and contemporaries of Hobson colleagues. Um, so please, my email, I'm going to um, actually, Katie can chat it out right now. It's Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, at prologcc.com. I'd welcome you to contact me. I'm going to be continuing to, to research and, and write about Hobson as part of a larger project. So I um, was very pleased to have the opportunity to get so many of you together tonight and, and uh, have this conversation um, and would welcome you all to, to stay in touch with me or to contact me if you're trying to, to contact others that are in this conversation tonight. So I think we're going to go ahead and close it out. Um, Thank you to Parisa. Thank you, Katie. Thank you to all the panelists and to all our special guests that tuned in tonight and spoke. Um, this has been this has been such a um, a rewarding conversation. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Chris. Have a good evening. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right. Let's see. Bye. Oops. Uh, here we go. Hi everyone. People are starting to exit. Oops, there's Richard. Aw. You know, you know what we could do, Sarah? We could yeah. have, we could record Richard, give his statement now. By the way, I'm back. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, I'll, be, okay. I'll, be very, I'll be very short. I'll okay. be very short. Anyway, Julius, let me see if I can get some light here on me. <laughs> so Julius believed in uh, the constitution and he believed in uh, individual rights. And this was a lawsuit that was Julius versus Wilson. And he not only won in the US district court, but he won in the Supreme Court of the United States to say forever that infiltration by police agents, whether FBI or at the local level, who had done nothing wrong except that they wanted to protest or talk, speak their minds, that that was unconstitutional in America. And that was a landmark that Julius has left for our country. And it's not a really well-known part of his history, but it's one that we should all really admire and really, realize how precious he was. I think it was Tina or it was Julius Jr. who said he believed in the constitution. He did believe in the constitution. He believed that we had rights and he exercised them. He went all the way to the Supreme Court. So I just wanna say it was an honor to have been a plaintiff with him and with the other members of the, uh, of the group. And it's just, um, he has left, it's a living legacy that he did this one little piece which many people probably don't know. And that's all I wanna say. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And I am glad that you were able to get back on and, and tell us about that. That's, that's so important. Thank you. Great. Thank you for both. All of you. right. And we have otherwise closed out the meeting, but we have, have recorded Richard. So mm -hmm. I'm going to stop my recording. Great. Good night, everyone. All right. Thank you, everybody. So, Thank you, Billy. How do you, how do you get the recording? Oh, I forgot to I forgot to mention that. Uh, so we will we'll share it out to all for, to everybody that registered, so that, that we'll share out a link to it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is Patricia. Hi. Hi. I'm <laughs> that you are able to join us. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful job. Thank you. I'll definitely be in touch with you. Okay. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Hi. You can just click on the hmm?